Uh, welcome to you all. My name is uh, Shukri Ahmed. I'm uh, the Deputy uh, Coordinator of FAO's Strategic Program on Resilience, uh, and I will be facilitating this event today. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, you to this first event of the series of webinars on resilience that will take place between May uh, and December 2016. The series of webinars will cover a variety of topics related to building and increasing the resilience of livelihoods to threats and crises, thus promoting food security and improving nutrition. It is an initiative organized within the INFORMED program funded by the European Union and implemented through FAO's strategic program on resilience. INFORMED stands for Information for Nutrition, Food Security, and Resilience for Decision Making. This event is particularly taking place within the framework of the knowledge sharing platform on resilience that FAO has put in place. Informed aims at providing technical, analytical, and capacity development support in order to increase the resilience of vulnerable people's livelihoods. This should be achieved through better informed and evidence-based decision making. Today's webinar is co-hosted by the FAO Strategic Program on Resilience and the European Union Directorate General for International Cooperation and Development, DG DEPCO. In this regard, we would like to thank our colleagues from EU DEPCO, C1, Rural Development, Food Security, Nutrition, and uh, 03, the budget, budget support and public finance management uh, for their kind support. FAO, in close collaboration with its partners, works to increase the resilience of agricultural livelihoods. At risk of disasters and crises in countries and regions around the world, people with resilient livelihoods are able to prevent and better withstand damage reduce the impact of disasters on their lives, and recover and adapt when disasters cannot be prevented. FAO's resilience work is defined around three main groups of shocks, natural hazards, including climate-induced extreme events, food chain crisis of transboundary or technological threats, including plant pests and diseases, animal diseases and food safety, and protracted crises, including violent conflict. It is anchored in a wide range of technical expertise on the various types of threats and shocks, the agricultural subsectors around four interconnected priority actions, which include short-term humanitarian and long-term development and investment interventions tailored to local livelihoods and agroecosystems. Agricultural livelihoods can only be protected from multi-hazards if adequate disaster risk and crisis governance is present at all levels. Monitoring crisis and disaster risk helps to prevent, prepare, and reduce the impact of such shocks and avoid a full-blown humanitarian crisis and the human suffering and costs associated with it. Tackling and reducing the root causes of vulnerability of individuals and communities with livelihoods depending on crops, livestock, fish, trees, and other renewable resources is fundamental. When disasters, conflicts, and or epidemics to strike, we must be prepared to face these shocks to lower their impact and respond in a timely and effective manner to save lives and livelihoods. Uh, allow me to say a few words on how this webinar will run. It will last around an hour and uh, a half and will be recorded. A link will be shared after the event so that all are able to see this presentation again. Following the presentation, you will be able to ask your questions using the chat box in the left side of your screen. 
participants' microphones are turned off in order to avoid any dis disrupting background noise. Uh, you will find related tweets under the hashtag uh, page for uh, resilience and hashtag UNFAO. Today, I'm glad to present our first speaker, Raffaello Cervini, who will be talking about enhancing resilience in Africa's dry lands. Raffaello Cervini is a lead environmental economist with the Africa region of the World Bank. He has 20 years of professional experience in program research financed by the World Bank, the Global Environment Facility, the European Union, and the government of Italy in a, in a variety of sectors. He is currently the World Bank's regional coordinator for climate change in the Africa region after serving for about three years in a similar role for the Middle East and North Africa region. I am particularly glad to launch our webinar series on Africa's dry lands. Dry lands are at the core of Africa's development challenge. Due to complex interactions among many factors, vulnerability to climate change and other risks in dry lands is growing and affecting livelihoods, prospects uh, of hundreds of millions of people. Without further ado, I would like to invite our guest speaker, Raffaello uh, Cervini. Raffaello, welcome. Uh, to just begin uh, with your work, then what are the challenges and opportunities of enhancing resilience in the dry lands uh, of Africa? Okay. Okay, thanks a lot for the uh, for the introduction and uh, good afternoon, I guess, for uh, most of you, maybe to morning in some cases. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, really pleased to be part of this uh, uh, of this series of uh, webinars, and I'm impressed by the number of people that are already attending. I understand that some more might join us in the course. Um, so uh, my job today, I think, is to give you a, a, an overview of a uh, fairly large program of analytics that we've been uh, undertaking over the last uh, couple of years in partnership with uh, a large number of organizations. So in that sense, I think I, I should be considered more like the spokesperson of this uh, group of uh, uh, kind of uh, expert practitioners um, and researchers um, that have carried out this work. Um, so uh, in fact, this is the, my first slide, just acknowledging the, uh, the role played by a number of organizations, including in particular our host today, the, uh, the FAO, that has contributed uh, uh, you know, quite a bit of the, uh, of the material and of the thinking uh, behind this, this report. Um, so let me uh, just uh, uh, you know, provide a little bit of uh, context and, and motivation for, for the work. Uh, as, uh, as our chair was indicating, uh, adrenals are really at the, uh, at the core of uh, much of the development challenges uh, in, in Africa. Uh, of course, they're, they're very, fairly big areas accounting for in, in the broadest sense for about 43% of land area, half the population, three quarters of agricultural land. And of course, they tend to be hotspot of, of poverty uh, in, uh, in, in many parts of the, of the continent. Uh, now, of course, we, uh, we, we focus our analysis really uh, on most of the two uh, main hotspots. So the, uh, the Sahel uh, in Western Africa and the Horn of Africa in, uh, in East Africa. Um, so the, uh, the the context, I mean, the, this work really started in the aftermath of uh, two of uh, uh, significant recent crises, uh, the uh, the Horn of Africa in 2011 and the Sahel in 2012. Um, and uh, what uh, the, the, the team at the World Bank was kind of asked to uh, and challenged to was to kind of uh, look at this issue, kind of uh, stepping a little bit back from the, uh, let's say, the immediate response to, uh, to the crisis, which is, of course, still a very important part of the, uh, uh, of the development challenge, but also looking looking a little bit at the, uh, at the overall kind of uh, uh, big picture. And the context, of course, is one in which there are many uh, initiatives looking at this, uh, at this uh, uh, topic. Uh, they're listed here, Agir in uh, West Africa, the Global Alliance in the Horn of Africa, Sahel, and, and so on. And, and of course, many different perspectives uh, come into, into the play, uh, so organizations with different backgrounds, different expertise, and so on. And um, what we really were trying to do with this report was really to kind of uh, 
um, you know, provides an overall sense uh, of the development challenge from a uh, medium to longer term uh, perspective. Uh, with the goal really to inform uh, not just the, the, the humanitarian response that followed the crisis, but much more really the next generation of programs that looked at the resilience, uh, resilience uh, challenges in a, in a kind of a strategic way. Um, so we wanted, uh, as listed in the slide, really characterize the, uh, the, the current and the future challenges um, uh, in a way that uh, uh, kind of a, is consistent with a, with a broad scope, as you, you can see, this is a, basically a con continent-wide assessment. Um, we wanted to also look at the main interventions uh, that uh, could be uh, put in place uh, focusing in particular on the livelihoods that are already uh, uh, in there, and I'll say this a little bit more uh, in the next uh, few slides. Um, we want to really to provide uh, an evidence-based framework uh, to kind of um, help decision makers in countries think about uh, uh, the longer-term challenges of enhancing resilience, and of course, sharing the knowledge uh, uh, across the region and, and more globally uh, on you know how to uh, how to think about and how to characterize the uh, uh, the way to uh, to address uh, resilience in the future. So um, I have another about 20 slides and so, but before going through the whole thing, I just wanted to give the audience a sense of where we headed, right? So basically the three key messages that are coming out of the, uh, the report, and I'll provide at the end of the talk uh, the links uh, to the report, which is available online, uh, as well as the, uh, I'll mention the background papers that uh, provide the uh, uh, let's say the technical and quantitative underpinning uh, of the uh, material in the report. So here are the three core messages. One uh, is that business as usual is not really uh, an option. So uh, projecting essentially the uh, the likely trend in population growth, economic transformation, and increased the stress uh, from climate change and other factors, we basically estimate that uh, uh, compared to uh, 2020, 2010, which was a reference year, by 2030, there will be uh, uh, there will be an increase of up to 70% overall in the drylands of East and West Africa of population vulnerable to, to drought. Um, and, and similarly, we spent actually quite a bit of time looking at uh, uh, one of the most, uh, like to say, sensitive and vulnerable groups, so the pastoralist and the agro-pastoralist. Uh, and, uh, and again, without uh, uh, you know a set of interventions in this uh, uh, for these livelihoods. Uh, we estimate there will be a strong push to drop out of these livelihoods uh, because essentially the, uh, um, the, the condition uh, as they are now, they don't really uh, permit to kind of support a growing population, particularly under condition of a fairly unequal distribution of the animal wealth, and I'll say a little bit more uh, in the future. So that's uh, it's also a quite important message if you think about uh, the, the way in which um, uh, you know, this kind of social dynamic might actually uh, evolve uh, into conflicts and, and potentially security threats in the region and beyond. Uh, the second message uh, it's, uh, it, it's a more, uh, much more positive one, uh, and is that uh, we, we actually can make a big difference. Uh, and so we, we looked uh, in detail at uh, uh, essentially ways in which we can promote improved management of uh, the, uh, uh, the livelihoods that are uh, found now in dryland, so looking at livestock farming. Uh, and natural resource management, and you know, coming up with a simple metric of resilience, which is essentially the number of the average number of drought-affected people in any given year, we estimate that there are opportunities to cut in half or more the number of people that would otherwise be affected by drought on, on every uh, given year. And we also found that the cost, uh, although uh, high in absolute terms. Uh, so between half a billion and one point three billion dollars per year is actually in the uh, domain of the of the feasible uh, is pretty much in line with uh, the current amount of the uh, uh, you know the development assistance in the in the region. The third message is that although there is a lot that can be done and a lot that uh, can actually mitigate uh, the challenge in a big way, uh, this is unlikely to be enough. Uh, so there will still be a significant amount of uh, uh, population that will remain vulnerable, uh, and they will be essentially hit by drought uh, in the future, particularly if uh, uh, you know extreme events due to climate change will intensify in the future. And so for that, we have to think a bit more out of the box. We have to think about uh, clearly improving the uh, uh, the safety nets, uh, both the coverage and the amount of uh, the amount of coverage. We have to come up with uh, an improved uh, way to mobilize uh, uh, financial resources in a, in a rapid way. 
but we also have to think about uh, a wider range of livelihoods that can provide a means of survival with a means of uh, kind of uh, prosperity for this population. Uh, and also, there is a big uh, agenda um, that uh, that uh, uh, speaks to the, the issue of landscape restoration. So there is a number of uh, uh, parts of, of the drylands where uh, the money opportunity for investing in improved uh, landscapes. And I'll try again to say something a bit more at the end. So uh, again, this is the scope of analysis, just to highlight the two hotspots that I mentioned before. Um, the analysis was broken down, is, is, as you can see, is a fairly kind of a, a broad scale. We try to kind of, a, um, uh, let's say, be more granular to the extent possible by looking uh, essentially at the, the three, uh, let's say, layers of drylands, so the arid, semi-arid, and dry subhumid uh, areas that are defined based on the widely uh, known and utilized aridity index. And in several parts of the analysis, we kind of overlaid uh, this, um, this, this, this let's say, division with administrative units. So essentially, we had uh, several hundred polygons, uh, so intersection of a rating zone and administrative units at the subnational level, where we tried to kind of provide as much granularity as possible to the, uh, to the analysis. Um, so the, the first part of the work, uh, and again, you, you will uh, find the link, so for those of you who have uh, interest, uh, you'll be able to, uh, you know, uh, see a lot more than I, what I can say today. But the first part of the work was uh, really to characterize the uh, challenges faced today uh, by drylands. And clearly land degradation is, is a big one, so uh, we're talking about uh, areas that tend to be, in which the share of uh, uh, degraded and degraded areas tend to be larger than the rest of the continents. Uh, climate variability is uh, clearly a distinguishing uh, feature of, of drylands, so uh, continuous uh, and, and uh, seemingly intensifying uh, cycles of uh, uh, dry spell and, and wet spells, with the dry spell, of course, being uh, uh, much more uh, kind of uh, much uh, more difficult to deal with. Uh, infrastructure, uh, so the, the share population uh, with uh, poor access to, uh, to markets tend to be higher, particularly in the uh, in the uh, in the higher uh, aridity areas. Um, in a lot of uh, cases, uh, the drylands tend also to be a hotspot for, for conflicts, including conflicts between different uh, livelihood types. Uh, many of you are familiar with the conflict, let's say, between uh, pastoralists and, uh, and, and farmers uh, in, uh, in a number of uh, parts of the, of the drylands. And of course, political marginalization, um, you know, being uh, uh, drylands dwellers are uh, typically uh, more remote and, and less able to kind of exert their, their influence. They also tend to be marginalized uh, in a number of important processes of, of decision making. Um, so, uh, and again, there is a lot more in the report, but uh, let me just highlight what are, uh, let's say, the, the uh, implications of these challenges. The first one, of course, is, the, uh, is, is poverty. So uh, if we look at the, uh, the poverty headcount by aridity zone in a subset of countries for which we have the recent uh, uh, survey data uh, from the LSMS program uh, of the World Bank, we can see that uh, the share of people below the poverty line tends to be systematically higher in drylands, particularly as, as we move from the less arid to the driest uh, area, at least for the six countries in which we, we have this, uh, this evidence. So, but that's not the, the only challenge or the only, let's say, negative uh, development outcome that we see. Um, again, uh, using the survey uh, information from those countries, we can see that the food consumption scores, so the quantity and the quality of the food intake, uh, tend to be uh, lower in, uh, in the drylands so for these six countries. Um, there is uh, uh, significantly higher shares of uh, children underweight uh, in the drylands. And for a, a subset of uh, uh, drylands inhabitants, so the pastoralist, uh, living uh, in this case in, uh, in East Africa, we also found consistent evidence of, uh, uh, of let's say, uh, uh, discrimination and kind of a poor uh, access to, uh, say, health services in the form of vaccination in this case, as well as uh, much lower enrollment rates uh, uh, compared to the non drylands areas of, of the same countries. Um, so. What about the future? So we spent uh, you know, quite a bit of time looking at the, at the future of drylands, and we, we did that uh, by developing a fairly uh, straightforward uh, kind of a conceptual framework 
looking at uh, the three dimension of uh, uh, vulnerability. So exposure, which is basically the number of people living in, in dry lamps now and, and in the future as a result of population growth. Sensitivity, which has to do with the, uh, the extent to which uh, people in dry lamps rely for their income and employment on uh, uh, economic activities that might be sensitive to, uh, to climatic uh, uh, shocks, particularly droughts, which is the focus of the report. And then the third dimension, uh, it's ability or inability to cope, and so uh, both the, uh, the availability of own resources, which of course uh, are much lower if people are poor, as well as access to, um, let's say, uh, safety nets or network of support from, uh, um, from friends and relatives. So these are the three dimensions. And the drivers are also equally important. Uh, we have population growth, um, which will add more people uh, that will compete for uh, scarce and fragile resources. We have climate change that will uh, is expected to change quite significantly the, uh, the extent of drought on themselves and uh, the range of uh, kind of climate shocks that might be experienced. And then, of course, an important one is economic transformation. And this is where I think it's also important to think a little bit more in a forward-looking way when we focus on the emergency response. We don't we don't have the time really to think that um, you know there will be a process of economic transformation that will change the the way in which um, uh, let's say the uh, um, uh, these uh, lovely groups will uh, say support themselves in the future, and this might change as a result of of, uh, of, uh, of economic transformation. So what we did. Um, so this is uh, just the, the overall framework that is used throughout the report, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to go uh, for each uh, single topic through the framework, but uh, I'll try to make a patient reference uh, and also as a way to kind of uh, uh, give you a sense of what you will find in the, uh, in the report. <coughs> 